Do you remember where you were on the 20th of February 2017? Probably not. How about on the 25th of November 2020? Um, I think you probably will if you've been using technology in a certain amount of time because both of these days were where we had really, really, really bad outages in AWS. The first one was the S3 meltdown in US East 1 in Virginia. And the story about this was the fact that the service team which managed the service were trying to actually fix a bug in the billing system, completely nothing to do with the S3 service. And they deployed a change. And by mistake, with the runbook that they run, somebody, I gather, fat fingered a number and kind of took down too many servers at the same time, which kind of caused a huge cascading failure, not only of S3, but of a number of other things which relied on S3. The AWS console, the status board, the AWS Lambda, ECS, EBS, a, much, a huge amount of things which actually kind of fell over because of that outage. The second one was the Kinesis um, outage which we had on November 2020, where in this case it actually was somebody which was trying to fix a problem in the service, and by mistake they added, instead of removing, a number of serv um, servers into the, uh, the pool which was serving the front end, and that addition had a configuration bug, which kind of brought down the whole front end, and again caused a cascading failure not only of Amazon Kinesis, but also of a number of other services, such as Cognito, CloudWatch, Autoscaling, Lambda, EventBridge, and, 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 and. Werner Vogels is the CTO of Amazon, and <clears throat> no matter how well you architect your application or how well you think you well architect your, your architect your application, something is going to break, always. And it's okay if it breaks. <laughs> because you have to also be ready for when things don't actually go as planned, and you should be planning for those kind of things as failure. So why did I bring these two examples? The, first, the main reason is because to show that everything which we think we do also has underlying implications which we rely on. I guarantee you that the EC2 service team or the CloudWatch service team or the S or the status dashboard did not wake up on that morning thinking, if S3 goes out, summing, I should be fine. Or this, they didn't even realize that there were some certain implications on the underlying infrastructure that they needed to take into account. And today, I'm going to be talking about the fact of there are implications of the underlying infrastructure when you run your container workloads. My name is Mesh Seidel Casing. I'm a developer advocate that works with, with Amazon ECS in AWS, located out of Israel. So thank you for inviting me over here to do the talk. It was a nice trip, it will be a nice trip. And as my job as a developer advocate, I speak to customers, or listen more, actually it's more listen to customers for their feedback to understand exactly what they want from our, from our product. I'm embedded in the actual service team. I work very closely with the product managers and the systems engineers which actually write the code in order to understand how I can improve or I would say, have impact on the roadmap in order to provide that feedback back into the product itself. It's kind of it's the, I'm the customer's voice inside the room whenever we have kind of these conversations. So this is the definition of chaos engineering from the principles of chaos. Essentially what this says is break things on purpose because it will lead to you gaining confidence inside your, in your system and making it better and having less downtime. And this is very simple. This is, chaos engineering is not a new concept, but there are kind of small little nuances which I would like to address here in this talk about what we have to think about, what you have to think about when you do this in a container platform. So let's go over the agenda for today. The first thing is what we're not going to be talking about. And we'll get to that in a second. And after that, we'll talk about the fact of what are health checks, and um, the underlying dependencies which you could have with inside your container orchestration or your container platform, and a bit of tooling, and we'll see what else we can get into if we have time. So what we're not talking about. We're not talking about how to deploy Kubernetes, if Kubernetes is better than another container orchestrator, if you can use ECS, Kubernetes, Nomad, Mesos, whatever is comfortable for you. We're pretty much, I think, at a stage at the 
in the industry today that if you're not following the best practices of deploying multiple availability zones, high availability, then you're in for a lot of pain in the future, but you should be doing that by default. And we're not going to be talking about how these orchestrators work, because we're also at, I think, a state in the industry that we can kind of rely on them to do what they say they're going to do out of the box. If they say they're going to scale up an instance or scale it down, it will probably do that, because we've got to a stage in technology where it actually works. So let's talk about health checks. A health check is very simply something which an application or a piece of code or whatever else it is, which asks a very simple question. Is my app healthy or isn't it not healthy? It has one simple job, to provide a yes or a no answer. The question is, and this is what we're going to dive into further, is what is that question? What do I need to check on my application? Usually we'd run this kind of a health check on a load balancer, very simply on a load balancer if you're using AWS, you would say what my, if my um, port is available or if um, I get a URL, et cetera, you can get into more detail as we will further over here. So the first one in, in AWS, we kind of divide these into a number of different groups. The first one is a liveness check. This is the most simple, simple one of all of them. A liveness check is there to understand the basic functionality of the service. Usually this can be done in Docker. If I have a port available, if I have a URL providing me a certain, uh, um, certain response code, these kind of things are done usually with a uh, monitoring agent or a load balancer which does those checks for you. And they're not very much that a developer actually needs to understand how to do these. It's usually part of the platform. Actually, in this case, it must be part of Docker. So there's nothing you really, really need to do over here. The second level are what we call local health checks. This is slightly more, I would say, advanced, that the fact that the actual application is aware in its own bubble of everything that it needs. Does it have a file system? Does it have access to the necessary components? Am I running the correct things? It's above and beyond more of a single, simple Docker health check. And this is something which you um, don't have your, your developers actually have I would say knowledge of it is something you actually have to think about a little bit more. So if we take, for example, an Nginx proxy, a local health check will define, for example, that I actually have access to that web server. So the previous one, which we said was giving a result on 200 port if it was running on Nginx, that would actually pretty much be a good local health check that I'm running. Two pro Nginx is giving me a 200 response. That means I'm actually got access to what I need on my local machine. The third one is what we call dependency health checks. So this is where each application understands that its underlying resources that it needs to access are available. These are more what we call sophisticated health, sophisticated health checks, where it allows you, for example, can I access my database? Do I have um, the right credentials to access those database? And if I don't, I will provide a failure. The problem with these kind of health checks, they can very, very often provide you a false positive because there's absolutely nothing wrong with your container. There's something wrong either with the underlying infrastructure in the background, the database is not ready, or the network is down, or I have an outage in S3 which brought down the whole world, that means I can't access anything. Your container is actually running, the process is there. So when you, when you do these kind of dependency health checks, you have to be very, very careful of the fact of what is the pulse, false positive, because if, for example, I keep on restarting my container on a regular basis, because my database is not available, that will not solve my problem. So think of these health checks as what you can as dependencies, but also remember that you have underlying dependencies as well, and they could provide false positives, so you also need to check those as well to see where the correlation between these different problems are. The last kind of health check is the anomaly detection. When we're talking about microservices, containerized systems, we usually talk about a decent amount of pods, not one or two. We can get to hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands, hopefully not, but that's okay. I don't think Kubernetes supports hundreds of thousands of pods on one, server, on one cluster, either ECS, but that's okay. Um, not everything will be the same, and you should be testing your underlying services for what is your norm. In other words, I have an application that should be doing X, Y, and Z at a certain amount of time. If I have one which is not and throwing errors or responding slowly, I would like to know about that. I want to understand because that can affect my application. I can get erratical behavior 
based on hitting that specific container or pod or availability zone because it's not acting or behaving correctly. Example for, examples for this, it could be, for example, something happened and the clock, this, the clock is skewed on the specific host that you are deploying and everything, all your logs are completely out of whack. Also, it could be that it's deployed with old code because it didn't get an update, also providing inconsistent results. So, we talked a little about the health checks. Let's talk a little bit about the dependencies. I used this graphic because it reminded me of the movie The Usual Suspects. I don't know if you've seen it. Kaiser Soze was awesome. And the, are the, as I'm saying, they are the usual suspects. When we're talking about the underlying dependencies, you can pretty much think what they are. They're CPU, memory, network, and that's about it, pretty much. These are the things which you have underlying dependencies when you run containers. Yes, there are things of security and specific hardware, but in general, we're talking about CPU, memory, and network. So let's see what we can do when we kind of try to test for chaos engineering and kind of these kind of experiments which we want to run. So for CPU, as I said, I'm assuming that the orchestrator, be it Kubernetes or ECS, and by the way, anything that I'm saying to you today is non-platform specific. I don't really care where you're running your, your containers today. It will work, or the information at least you can use is exactly the same for any one of the others. So I'm assuming that when I ask my orchestrator to give me a one virtual CPU pod, it will give me that one virtual CPU. I don't necessarily have to start testing if I got the full amount of that CPU for that. And I also can assume that the Linux kernel or in Windows, which I don't really pretty much do anymore, and I hope for your benefit that you don't do it too much anymore either, um, is it will slice that CPU based on the amount that I get. So in other words, it will ensure that I got my one virtual CPU out of the four on the physical host or virtual machine, whatever it may be, and I don't have to worry about that too much. But what will happen if I start loading the CPU inside my actual application? Start chewing up CPU cycles, which the actual application my container should be trying to use. How will it behave? Will I be able to continue to write logs? Will I continue to be able to provide service to my, uh, my customers based on what I'm supposed to do? If you run an experiment which will load test your CPU inside your container, I assume you will learn new things. Besides the fact, of course, that the orchestrator will probably scale everything up because it recognized the CPU spike, but still, how will your application behave? Something that you should actually look at. And again, I'm assuming that we can also rely on the orchestrator. When I ask for a certain amount of memory, I'll get a certain amount of memory. It will be separated from the other pods or the containers running inside my cluster. But without enough memory, you pretty much nothing. I do not remember my daughter's cell phone numbers. I have them as a speed dial in my phone. I don't know the number, honestly not. But I don't need to because I have something to remember for me. But sometimes my phone starts to lag because I have too many applications. The thing goes slowly and then I can't get hold of my daughter and it takes time and I get frustrated. So with memory, when you start chewing up memory, this is starting to annoy me, sorry. One second. Sorry about that. When your memory starts, either because of a memory leak, memory leak inside your application, or if you have some kind of memory issue inside, running inside the container, whatever it may be, things are going to start going wrong. What they will be, I'm going to leave that for you to find out in your specific application. Will your logs work? Will your application crash? Will it start responding slowly? Will it cause any kind of issues on my downstream services? Running experiments like this will teach you a lot. My favorite is the network. And yes, it is always the fault of the network, unless it's DNS or the network. But as opposed to the CPU and memory which we talk about, or the fact that I can rely on my underlying infrastructure to give me what I want, that is not the case with inside your CEO network tra traffic. There is nothing today in any of the orchestrators that can guarantee you network bandwidth for a certain pod or a certain container, which means you're going to have a noisy neighbor. If something is chewing up too much network on that physical host, then something is going to go wrong with everything else running on there. Running experiments, for example, injecting latency into your applications will help you to understand what that's going to happen. Will your applications continue to work? 
Will they fail? Will they provide errors? Will they start retrying? If retrying, after how long can they cache requests? These are kind of things that, when you run these kind of experiments, you should actually not only run them in the actual containers themselves, but also in the physical infrastructure which is underneath, on the EC2 hosts or the virtual machine host, whichever they are, whichever cloud you're running them on. I used to crimp my old, my cables once upon a time, until I found out that it was too much of a pain in the neck, and sometimes I didn't do it properly, and I would rather have done it by buying a ready-made network cable. So can network cables disconnect? There's nothing you can do. There are physical cables running eventually somewhere. They can get damaged. Somebody can step on one, unfortunately. They have Bit can flip on a network card somehow, once in a million, 10 million, 100 million different kind of packets going through. And when you get to very large scale, that can happen once every 10 minutes. So what happens when you start having network packet loss? When traffic doesn't go correctly, does your application know how to recover properly? Does your application know how to queue up those requests? Do I start causing a cascading failure on the underlying applications beneath me? Things you should actually check about. And the last one is a black hole. When, in other words, for example, something falls off the network because of an outage of infrastructure or a host, whatever it may be, it still thinks it's running, probably will continue running until it comes back, and something the orchestrator will hopefully um, recover. But what happens once that happens? Am I providing stale information, injecting stale information into my applications? That could cause errors that you can do by black holing a specific pod or bless, blacklisting, or black holing a specific um, instance to understand where this goes. So, we talked about different kinds of tests, different kinds of things you need to look into. Where do you go from here? In Amazon, we have something which we like to call the flywheel. Every team has their own flywheel for their own service, for their own organization, for their own whatever. And the flywheel for uptime is something which looks like this. And I'm going to start up there by the prepare. If there is one thing that you take from this talk, please do not run chaos experiments unless you know what you're doing and what's going to cause. The preparation stage is running through some kind of a scenario of I'm going to do X, Y, and Z, and I expect this to happen. If I do that, what is going to happen to my application? Should I run it on a production part? Should I run it on a testing or on a development station? What am I actually going to do as my experiment? That is the first thing you get. You get a run book. I'm going to run this. It's going to happen. That's, going to what, that's what we're going to do. That's what I expect to happen. The next part, of course, is the detect. The detect is you run that experiment, and you validate what you expected to happen was there. Did I get the correct alarms? Did I see the right logs? Did the right people get involved in the call which was spun up at 3 o'clock in the morning because we had the outage. Did they get rec correct? People get paged. These are things that you have to understand. Did I know what was going on? Could I see what was happening? Did I understand what was happening? The next part is the respond. The respond is you understand, okay, I know what happened. This was the steps that I was wanted, I took in order to resolve the outage. In my case, it could be, for example, Kubernetes or ECS automatically scaled up and handled the outage because I had a CPU spike. That also could be very valid, and that could be fine, as long as you understand the steps before what was happening, and that's what was supposed to happen, and that's good. But it also could be that I needed to push a new configuration change, deploy that to all my hosts or instances in the cloud, and hopefully everything was all fine and dandy. The stage after that is the learning stage. Everything is back to normal, everything is back to where it should be, your customers are no longer impacted, and now we do the fact of a, like a retrospective. Or the way we like to call it in AWS, the COE, correction of errors process, and we'll go into that in a few minutes, what exactly that, that process is. And from that process, we learn what we were missing, what we can improve, how we can improve also our deployments, our code, our people, our processes, the information we need to understand in order to react better. And the whole benefit of this whole cycle and doing it continuously on a regular basis is to reduce the number of outages and reduce the wear and tear on people waking up in the middle of the night to fix your applications, because that's actually the worst problem of everything. Could be that you need, as part of your learning process, to decouple services, change your services, rewrite code, or it could be that, for example, you just need to make a configuration change and push it to Git. That could be as simple as that. 
It will depend specifically on your use case, your scenario, and what you need to learn. The tooling you can use for this, there's Chaos Monkey from Netflix, Litmus Chaos, which is an open source tool. Um, have Gremlin, which is a third party commercial tool, partners of AWS if you would like, they can run this on multiple, multiple applications, platforms, different services, different uh, technologies that you would like. And there's also, last but not least, Amazon Fault Injection Simulator, actually it's AWS Fault Injection Simulator, I apologize, the naming is wrong, but I'll fix it in the slide afterwards, which is a chaos as a service service, if you would like, <laughs> inside AWS where you can target specific things safely, controlled in a certain way. You can also provide, like for example, circuit breakers, which allow you to say if, my, if, I, um, if I trigger a certain alarm, automatically roll back the test and stop it to the previous state that it was in. Number of configurations that allow you to do these kind of things. And it is the fact that, for example, it is as granular as you would like it to be. You can run chaos tests that you can expose these tests to a developer specific environment inside your account or to the production whichever you would like so not everybody gets access to everything and you provide a secure platform for your applications. So, what is a COE? Correction of errors. Every week on Wednesday at nine o'clock Pacific time, we have a two hour meeting with pretty much the, almost all the senior people within AWS, all principal engineers, head of VP of infrastructure, and further and further and further. And it's a two-hour meeting every single week, and it's like what we say, the holy, not the holy grail, but it's something which is never ever canceled unless it's Christmas week or something else. It falls out on a holiday, but usually never done. But in this meeting, we go over pretty much on a regular basis any outage which had customer impact in the toll in the complete Amazon um, portfolio. It can be the AWS part, it can also be other things as well. And the idea of a COE is a mechanism. It's something which we have, it's a muscle which in AWS we have learned to use very, very well on a regular basis that allows us to essentially learn from our previous mistakes. We have, um, this meeting where everybody sits and reads a document, what hand will go exactly what the structure of a COE actually looks like. But the idea is, as I said, outages will and always do happen, no matter how well you plan for it. The question is, what do you do when they happen? And how you learn to make things better and improve your operational processes and your code and your monitoring and everything else. This is what the COE is for. It is not a blame game. It's not to point fingers at a certain person or a certain team or a certain engineer that did something because that's not what the purpose of a COE or a retrospective, however you would like to call it. And it's also not a punishment. Nobody gets, I would say, looked down upon or any kind of um, bad vibes because they did something, but that's not the way it works. Specifically in Amazon, we have the fact of two pizza teams, if you've heard the concept before, where Essentially, the size of a team shouldn't be more than you can feed with two pizza dishes, which is about six or seven people. And every time you get to a team which is greater than that, they split it up because that's the, most, that's the smallest service you can actually can kind of handle with in, in, in a certain way. And it is a collective responsibility. It's not somebody's fault. It is part of the team and we learn from it. When would you run through this kind of process for a COE. So when you had an outage, of course, when it's customer facing impact team, so you learn because you would like to understand what happened, how, what kind of impact it had, what did it do to the business, what did it do to our people and doing in the background. And above and beyond that, where, for example, in our test case, which we ran before when the flywheel for the preparing, we expected something completely to happen and we understood when we ran that test that it brought down the whole system because we weren't ready for it. That would be something which you would run a COE because you should have understood that. What did we miss? If um, the use case, we tried to do something and we completely tested the wrong thing and because we caused, caused an outage or an outage occurred because we didn't test the specific use case. And the last one, of course, is um, anything that we can prove, improve on. For example, what we call these our wins, where we actually took a action item in the service team to improve something. For example, um, 
replacing a certain version of Java in all of our components to a newer version in introduced the fact that we now reduce the latency by 40%. And of course, it's backed by numbers, and it's something which anybody else besides in one of the service teams that did this can also learn from. It will improve the services across multiple, multiple services. So those kind of opportunities are things which we want to do and share across the organization. So what does the COE kind of look like? The first part is the supporting information, that what we call what happened. What happened usually has the impact, and the impact is not that the fact that my, for example, if we take the Nginx example before, that my Nginx service stopped. The impact is that, for example, 35,000 customers could not push the purchase now button because my web service was not working. That is the impact. So you understand also from the monetary, the money, the monetary side of the business what actually happened. It has to, of course, be backed by a timeline. When did we understand, when did the outage occur? When did we recognize it occur? And a timeline of what actually happened afterwards. We found the logs, we saw the outage, we identified what the problem was. And all of these, of course, should be backed by metrics, which hopefully you got based on your chaos experiments and your flywheel that you continually did to understand your services. The metrics you'll be able to see because a picture is better than a thousand words no matter how much you try to describe, but if you see a drop of 70,000 requests to zero, you understand that there was actually a big problem. And the last one is the incident questions of what did we actually do to find the issue? We dove into logs, we got the logs from somewhere, we got a page, somebody was in call, called onto the on call, and we started digging in in all those questions of how we defined, um, how we understood what the issue was and how we, held, uh, how we handled it. The second part is the corrections, which are the learning and the action part. Here we have the five whys. Anybody know what the five whys are? For those of you who don't, five ways is kind of a mechanism in order for you to understand the actual underlying cause, and I won't say root cause because there is never really one root cause of a problem. So the underlying reasons of what happened. So if, for example, I take my uh, Nginx service, why did the Nginx service stop? Because the um, configuration that was pushed to um, my cube config or my ECS task was incorrect. And why was it incorrect configuration pushed? Because nobody actually did a two-peer review on the code which was pushed. And why didn't they do a two-peer review on the code which was, which was um, pushed? Because they'd already been fighting SEV1 um, problems for the past week and nobody had any sleep for the past three days. And why didn't they do that? Because there weren't enough people in my team. Continue asking why those questions after another, not necessarily have to be five, it can be more, it can be less, until you get to a proper answer of what was the actual reason that was causing this problem underneath, because it wasn't the fact that the container crashed or your Nginx no longer responded. It was the fact of a number of underlying things which you need to fix relatively important soon, because if not, it's gonna happen again and again and again and again and again, in order for you to understand what was the underlying cause. Action items, as we said, we have a single threaded owner of the specific COE, which is the owner of what we need to fix. We need to, for example, make sure, if we go back to my Nginx example, that every code is enforced by two-peer code review, that nobody has an on-call rotation of more than seven hours, and nobody has the fact that nobody's overworked, whatever. These kind of things, of course, these action items can also be physical things, or they can be things which you can implement as code. For example, I put in a policy, which means that nobody can actually do this anymore by mistake and automatically approve. And all these action items, of course, have to have a date with a relatively, I would say, reasonable amount of frame time for things not next year when we get to it after our backlog and technical debt and everything else is done. But yes, these things have to be improved in order for you to make your processes better. The last thing which you should actually write is the summary. A summary is, after you've got all this information, an executive summary of approximately one paragraph, what happened, how we understood it, what was the impact, and what we're going to do to fix it. Um, okay. I'm going to leave you with four links. You can, if you want to capture the QR codes, I do know that the presentation will be available afterwards on the site so you can download them, but anyway. The first one is a article from the AWS Builders Library. These are in-depth white papers where our principal engineers 
share the, I would say, not the philosophy or the methodology of how we do things in AWS. This one specifically is how to create proper, proper health checks. Most of this, the information from the presentation today came from here. Second one is a uh, self-paced lab, if you would like to do something on AWS to implement those kind of things. We have something which is called, called the well-architected well -architected reliability lab, where you can go through the process, run these health checks, understand what these kind of things are doing. Third one is the product page for AWS Fault Injection Simulator. And as of, what is the date today? The 18th. Um, a week and a half ago, all of these things are currently available for testing in Fault Simulator, both on EKS and ECS, if you would like to test these specific things of network, fault M, black hole, latency, packet loss, CPU, memory, IO stressing, all those things you can actually do today with inside all the container platforms in AWS, if you would like. And the last one is a link to the principle of chaos's website, which I used in the beginning. The last thing before we all go to beer and have a nice cold drink because it's very warm here. <laughs> um, the QR code. In AWS and Amazon, we are what we call customer obsessed. And I love to work back from our customers. And that means that small QR code is a two question survey. So if you would please do me the honor of filling it out 100% anonymous, just to understand your feedback on the session, if it was useful, if it was um, beneficial for you, if there's anything you would like to see different, or if I could change or improve on it, I would really, really appreciate your feedback. And I'm on Twitter, DMs are open, my email is over there on the screen as well. Um, before we go to beer, I'm going to give anybody if they have any questions. Thanks. Um, you talk about the continuous improvement of, uh, of uh, detecting, learning, and responding to chaos engineering. And these continuous um, are already concepts known in DevOps engineering. So um, my question is like, do you have an opinion on how um, chaos engineers and DevOps engineers should or work together and how they can integrate those kind of workflow that we see already in Carlos Engineering in the workflows in DevOps Engineering, which... So I will repeat the question just for um, benefit of those who didn't hear. How can you integrate this kind of concept of chaos engineering and um, testing and on continuous improvement in your, I would say, DevOps practice or your continuous development practice? Oh, this here. Um, I would think that would be part of the flywheel. And as soon as you continuously do this on a regular basis and not once a month or a quarter or a year in order to find out where the problems are, and you improve the, implement these kind of practices, for example, up to a, I would say, a level where you can do it for every push of Git for your commands. In other words, you can run these tests to see if you've broken anything if you're in your environment. That would be the best ideal for implementing these kind of things in your DevOps and development practices. It's not easy. I can guarantee you it's not easy. The ideal and utopia and Valhalla, which we would like to get to, is to have this as part of our development and CI/CD pipeline, that every single push goes through some kind of also chaos testing to see if we've introduced any kinds of bugs as well. Um, when you mentioned monitoring, you also talked about anomalies. Um, what do you do about false positive monitors, which happen quite regularly, at least in our platform, and we just kind of adapt to it if, if a monitor pops out a lot of time, and we know nine of ten times it's a false positive. Do we have any policy for those monitors, which can't be fine-tuned enough? So. If I rephrase your question, what do we do with output all these alerts which are not really, they're not interesting to us, and they don't really give us enough information? I think the answer is in the question that I rephrased. Try and make them more, more, uh, more inf interesting. If it's something which is giving you information that you don't really care about, it's not useful. So, for example, I don't need to monitor the CPU inside my container, not necessarily. Because if it does spike, I'll probably get that information from the orchestrator which starts scaling up. Yes, for these outliers, as we said, there are certain things you need to do monitor and understand where it's, it's more for, I would think, the performance aspect. If I have 100 
tasks or pods running inside the cloud, and one of them is really misbehaving. It's pretty relatively simple to understand where it differs from the norm based on your metrics and your graphs. But for false positives, the only thing I can tell you is try to get better information and find out exactly what you're looking for, because if the information is not useful, it's, it, it's a waste of resources, time, and alerts, which are going to cause, I would say, fatigue and um, ambivalence to whatever's supposed to be happening in the platform. Any more questions? Yeah. Is kind of a slight follow-on to that one. Uh, every single anomaly detector I've used has been utterly 100% accurate at alerting people on bank holidays, and there have been more of those than actual outages. Have you found any way of mitigating against that? Because every low traffic alarm guarantee goes off 9 a.m. when everyone's trying to have a line on a bank holiday morning. Yeah, the answer, do I have a, uh, a good answer for anomaly detection, which actually wakes you up on the wrong time of the morning? No, I don't. Um, it's writing better tests, writing better alarms, and trying to understand or filter through the noise, which not necessarily should be something which is waking you up. It's blanking out the traffic alerts on bank holidays. That might not be a good idea, and you won't hear that as a recommendation from me, but um, that is one way of doing it. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much for your time. The beer is waiting, and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>